Hello and welcome to GMF Arts Dialogue, conversations with artists and creatives across the globe about the role of culture in a world where disruption has become the norm. Well, in this episode, we'll talk about the streaming revolution, how platforms like Netflix have impacted film and television and radically changed how we consume, access and create cultural content. And these are my guests. Kenneth Yang is an award-winning director from Nigeria whose films include titles like Confusion Nawa, The Lost Cafe, and most recently the Netflix drama Oloture, which tells the story of a young journalist who goes undercover to expose the brutal world of human trafficking. So welcome to you, Kenneth. And Sabina Demart. Sabine Demat is president and executive producer of Gaumont GmbH. That's the German subsidiary of the French Gaumont, which she built from the ground up. And she is responsible for the hit Netflix series Barbarians about the Battle of Teutoburg Forest back in 9 AD. So a warm welcome to you, Sabine. A warm welcome to you both. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Now, I want to get started with you, Kenneth, because Netflix has really made such huge inroads into the African market, investing hugely in original African content to the delight of viewers everywhere. Now, you are Nigeria's first male director of a Netflix original with Oloture, and that created quite some buzz upon its release worldwide. Can you tell us what kind of impact or reception did it have in Nigeria? For me, the, the release of Oloture um, actually opened my eyes to a lot of things, which is that there are, there are issues around uh, the continent and, of course, my country that we usually take for granted. And I know that uh, I get to travel a lot to some European countries, and I usually see some of these African sisters, and especially Nigerians, on the streets in some of these corners, right? So for me, I actually thought that everyone would be aware of the prevailing issue of sex trafficking. But with the release of Olotere, I realized that a lot of people didn't actually know what was going on. So in terms of the impact, like it, 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 it was huge and it brought in um, a lot of conversations about trafficking and basically about the economics of Nigeria in terms of why would people be able to, why should people um be pay, pay money in order to be trafficked so yes it brought conversations around sex trafficking and of course um economic issues as well okay that's very interesting and of course it it it, it reached a, a worldwide audience literally from day one um and and that was that was quite extraordinary the uh, extraordinary the effect that it had sabina barbarians on the other hand broke all kinds of streaming records upon its release in October of 2020, marked Netflix's most successful start for a foreign language series. And I think it was even the most popular foreign language uh, series in the US in all of 2020. How do you explain that success? I think Barbarians um, is a very good example of uh, what streaming services can do and bring to the table because this topic, uh, which is factual based, so it's a true story, uh, or in most of the parts, a true story, um, uh, is uh, educational but in a very entertaining way. So, and we, we managed to uh, really produce a popcorn series with, uh, which was very emotional uh, and uh, touched uh, a topic, uh, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, which wasn't uh, able to be produced beforehand. So this was something uh, that was really very interesting for the audience, but also in a professional world, uh, because there were so many projects that tried to pull that topic off but there wasn't the budget for it. And of course, the genre of battle series like the Vikings and so is very popular all over the world. And we hit right into that. Now, you told me that bar barbarians literally got picked up in record time for a German production. Can you just tell us about, about sort of how streamers have, have generally changed the way that productions are made compared to traditional broadcasters? 
um, I think uh, there was really a little revolution uh, with uh, someone like Netflix uh, appearing on the scene. Because, for example, the German market and, and many international colleagues are very envious about that, has always been very healthy in terms of uh, production and commissioning. But uh, there were like specific slots that were uh, uh, their, their framework was always very tight in a way. So the, also the writers were used to write uh, for the needs of these specific slots. So suddenly uh, Netflix appeared uh, and anything was possible. Uh, so there, there, there was the option to tell different stories and uh, a serialized drama in a, a different way. So you, you could line out and develop a, a broader world of characters and go deeper into them. Because on, on normal television, the serialized drama was very, very rare. So in this sense, every producer and especially the writers were very happy that this uh, option uh, arose through the streamers. Thanks for that. Now, Kenneth, I'm, I'm assuming it was very similar to you, similar but different. I mean, compared to your earlier productions, Netflix really simplified um, production and, of course, things like being able to secure support. Yes, I mean, when I was actually surprised that um, Germany uh, is actually going through almost the same thing in terms of um, slots and what kind of productions that you actually uh, that that filmmakers are encouraged to make. I mean, in Nigeria, for instance, there's a, there's a, there's a huge um, shift towards the comedy genre, especially in, in theaters. So people who make um, really different kinds of films in terms of like what, what sort of like um, personal topic you want to talk about, I think that they, they are mostly discouraged by the, by, by, by the people who run the exhibition houses. So with Netflix coming on the scene um, and, and Oluchire getting snapped up and a lot of other projects um, have, have been commissioned and released from Nigeria. And now there's this the whole fear surrounding filmmakers making films and the films ending up in their in their wardrobe or under their, their beds. It's it's no more there because because this is actually um, an option that that your films can be seen all around the world. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, as a story of human trafficking, Olotere is, a, is an absolute departure from, from Nollywood conventions, as you mentioned. I mean, uh, to what extent has it has Netflix and the advent of streamers, I know Amazon is moving into Nigeria very soon, enabled a real evolution in Nigerian cinema, allowing it to sort of challenge its own stereotypes and, 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 uh, and show, show the powers that be, the distribution uh, cartels that you've had, that you can make serious films? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's, it's always been a battle for, for filmmakers, for imagined filmmakers to, to tell stories that they're very passionate about because of, because of like, I mean, the, the sort of like as in block that you will have in, in terms of, um, in terms of distribution. So right now, um, filmmakers with Olotere being, of course, a hard hitting subject. And, and I think the executive producer wasn't really thinking much more about theatrical. I think like, I mean, it was made as a passion project, but then with Netflix picking it up and, and right now, um, Amazon coming in, but mostly Netflix has really commissioned a lot of projects and Amazon too is really interested in some of this African content. So I think that right now, this, this, that sort of like has in freedom for people to, to be able to, um, to make films that they're really passionate about and explore, I mean, all sort of genre and all sort of um, topics. Mm -hmm. Has it been a liberation for you in the sense, uh, I know you've talked about in terms of how you can possibly document history in your future work? Yes, of course. Like, I mean, I feel um, as, as a creative, I feel totally liberated because right now um, I'm actually um, currently um, developing something. I mean, in, 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 there's a very far departure from like what is really mainstream Nigeria. And for me, it is it is the it is that whole knowledge that I have um, streamers like Netflix that um, will have the that will actually give me um, a platform to be able to, to show my film. And of course, you know, the thing with filmmaking is that when you make the film, it is not about making the film. It is how you're going to sell it. How will people see it? And with that, yes, um, I think like this, this actually um, a window there for us to to explore all kinds of stories. So, yes, I feel totally liberated as a, as a creative. 
back over to you, Sabina, because Barbarians is performed in a mixture of German and Latin, which, of course, would have been unheard of uh, just a few years ago. You mentioned education. So how do you see the cultural and educational role that streaming can play here? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, and this has actually started, I think, with the Scandi Noir movies or series uh, coming into Germany, that uh, one key thing is to be authentic. So, for example, for Barbarians, we had uh, historic advisors and we asked what would be the right language uh, to give to the Romans. Uh, do they speak Italian? Should they speak English? Or what would be the tr transferal? And then they said, actually, they would speak Latin. And we wanted to be as authentic as possible. And by the way, they said that the uh, Germanics, uh, there's not so much known of how they really spoke, uh, so that the right way to translate it would be normal German. Um, and this is what we did. Uh, and I think the authenticity makes these series so profound. Uh, and also for the content, it was good because we really wanted to um, open the view on the um, yeah, diversity and the uh, um, immigration story. That there's, it's an immigration story of Arminius, our leading uh, hero, who has a, a, a very diverse identity. So he's not 100% German or Germanic and not 100% Roman. So he is dealing with this these questions, where do I want to live, how do I want to live, where do I belong and what is my home? And this is, uh, during the course of the series, the, 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 the guiding question. What do, um, we talked about this when we spoke earlier, what do Netflix successes that we're seeing at the moment, um, things like Squid Game or Bridgerton, um, Barbarians as well, obviously, tell you about the emotional needs of uh, viewers out there? I think it's really, you, you connect the most if it is a true story that comes from the heart of the, the creatives and uh, who delivers uh, the connection to the emotions and it is a local story that is opened up for a global market so ultimately it's always emotions that that keep you that keep you going and the emotions whether it's in nigeria or in germany it's always the same everybody wants to be loved everybody wants to be recognized uh, uh, and w wants to achieve something uh, in, in their respective lives. And this is this emotional ground is everywhere the same. Kenneth, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, would, would you say that the streaming has definitely changed the expectations of viewers in terms of the authenticity that, that uh, Sabina mentioned? Yes, I mean, um, for, for us in Nigeria, for instance, right? Um, we now have to think about making films because we're going to be competing and programming, of course. Like we have to, we're going to be competing with the Squid Games and 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 Barbarians and and of course like Hellbound. So so for me, I think um, expectations has really changed because now we have a lot of viewers who have really become way literate in terms of like accessing some of this international content, and of course they are going for the same sort of emotion, like I mean from what they've seen. So. There's, there's no lowering of the standard for you as a creative. I think like now you have to compete on a, on a big global level. And so we have to just make sure that we, st we stay on, on, we have to make sure that as creative, we, we produce programs that will, will actually compete. And so um, the pressure is there for, for, for creatives. And for me, what I actually see that I'm really happy about is that for a very long time, we always talk about making films that would travel films that will connect universally. It doesn't matter if you're in Germany or you're in Venezuela. And 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 there's been there's been a, a kind of like I mean a kick against it in terms of like I mean um when imagine filmmakers come with that idea. But right now um I'm really glad that a lot of filmmakers, because of the pressure of international programming, they have to make sure that they are in line with what we've been talking about. So it's always it's coming for us at the right time, I think. That's, that's uh, very interesting in terms of, of what it can mean for Nigerian society. Tell us about the problems that you have, Kenneth, with censorship, because I know they are, they are extensive. How do you deal with that and have the streaming services help to change anything uh, in that respect for you? I mean, um, 
the, the problem of censorship is there. I mean, it's been there, of course, like from other countries. But I think like, I mean, of course, when you look at maybe what happened back in the day in, in, in America and of course in, in the UK, but in Nigeria at the moment, right? What we have is that there are certain things, that there are certain taboo topics that they really don't want you to talk about, right? For instance, we can't actually talk about maybe uh, the, the civil war that happened, the Biafran civil war. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a film um, that, that was made and, and it had a lot of problems in terms of censorship before it was passed. And, and of course, like um, you, you want to talk about other topics, other taboo topics that you feel um, you, should, you shouldn't talk about, maybe the issue of maybe same sex, for instance, right? Some of these are really, um, some of these are really topics that you can't really touch. But with uh, with streaming, and if, in some cases, even the words that you render. But I think like some of these um, taboo topics, subjects. Can, can, I mean, with with streaming now, exactly. I mean, um, taboo subject with streaming now. We have um, the ability to to actually have our program is out there. But the thing is that there's been like rumor recently that. Uh, the government even is thinking about censoring Netflix and there's a huge kick against it by filmmakers because right now, um, if you're going to release your films in the theaters, of course, like the censorship or if it is going to be direct to TV. And I think like the streaming services are giving us a bit of like, I mean, creative control. But now uh, if the government actually enters into that field, then um, you'll have to start the battle all over again. That's uh, yeah, that's an interesting problem. Uh, an interesting point. As we had a little, a little outset so there, Kenneth. With maybe, do you want to repeat your last sentence? Okay, that's that's me. Yes, now I can hear you. Do you want to just repeat your last sentence so that I can hear what you were saying on the end there? Okay, so what I was saying is that, like, um, in terms of some of these taboo topics, where Netflix and and other streaming platforms are giving us an outlet to be able to to bring out our content the way that we design it to be in terms of like i mean what we feel about it and and the, even the emotional connections and and just the ability to just be away from censorship and so right now um there's been rumors that even the the nigerian government might actually uh try to censor some of the the programs that are going on those platforms and i think that um the, the filmmakers are really kicking against it because it is almost like our 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 last frontier basically for self-expression because um, there are a lot of things they are really hard when it comes to theatrical and of course television content in terms of um, censorship so yes there's been a lot of like i mean kick against um, the government coming into streaming platforms but i think they're, they're actually planning and thinking about that well that'll be an interesting development obviously that we'll have to watch and one will have to look for new loopholes sabina demont streaming has had a huge effect on on user behavior as we've as we've uh, surmised and and consumption habits as well it's democratized consumption very much, but it's also put users into into bubbles through through its algorithms. Where would you say that we might need to reflect a bit more critically? Of course, the algorithms and, and if you produce for Netflix and you get a little insight into how their marketing works and how much uh, that plays a role, um, the, the algorithms, that that is fascinating, but it's also a little bit scary. Uh, so of course, they can, these algorithms uh, analyze precisely uh, what you like to watch, for how long you like to watch it, uh, when you switch your program. So they, they know everything about your profile. And then uh, you get suggested what you already um, like. So this means that it also reduces uh, the variety of program that is out there and is suggested to you. So this is something, of course, that would be good if there was more freedom of choice. Uh, on the other hand, it's also a question of time and everybody wants to be kind of confirmed in what they like and uh, they, everybody's happy to, to, to get the proposal of uh, which you yourself uh, uh, will probably be happy with. Um, but on the other hand, we, and this is with all the technical um, uh, uh, development, you have to see, and this is where uh, fake news come from, that it's not everything repeated and repeated, and uh, you don't look across the border kind of thing. That you actually are, are, have the ability to at least uh, get some other influence in there. Sabina, do you think traditional broadcasting is still needed? 
Absolutely. <laughs> we see a big transition now in uh, uh, traditional broadcasting because uh, it's not the old target groups anymore where they uh, they are measured with a little box and like in the old fashioned way, but it's more like communities that are watching. And um, what the traditional broadcasting uh, offers and especially the public one is the uh, uh, variety of content uh, that is not profit driven. And while a streamer that is uh, who is profit driven will always reprodu reproduce what is very successful, uh, and um, uh, this is not what a, what the um, task of a public broadcaster is, for example, but to represent the variety of society, including information um, uh, and news. So it's interesting because great variety on the streaming side now and bringing uh, content traveling really everywhere over the globe, but the educational um, job, let's say, of public broadcasters uh, still very still very important there. Kenneth, perhaps a response from you uh, on, on the role of traditional and public broadcasting. Do you see linear formats even as, as still playing a role in the future media landscape? Well, um, if, if I'm to be honest, I think that um, with time, there's going to be this gradual eroding of um, linear uh, broadcasting um, because because uh, people are really having short interest span. I mean, we have a lot of, I mean, young people growing up and, and, and they have access to a lot of technology and sites. And so a lot of things actually happen on the go and people really want to see programs the way, I mean, almost immediately, that is actually why they binge watch. I remember when I was growing up, it was very different when I was growing up because we had to wait till like 4 p.m. in the evening before we'll be able to watch TV. But right now people have um, access to Netflix with a lot of content, I mean, all of it. So I don't think young people here around me, they have the patience to sit down and just like, Follow through the programming of um, traditional broadcasters. So yes, I think that, um, and, and this is just now, 2021, right? But I mean, think about it. In 10 years, I mean, what is the what is the mood going to be around here? And that is actually how I gauge it. Sabina, I think you have something to say. Do you want to add to that? Yes. I completely agree with Kenneth, um, uh, but in, for example, in Germany and maybe in other countries as well, uh, also the formerly linear broadcasters. Uh, they adapt to streaming because they have their own <laughs> streaming platforms. It's more the question where the money comes from. So, uh, and of course, with the public broadcasters, um, there's no pressure uh, that uh, there's profit because they're not allowed to make any profit. And this is the, the great chance in it. So traditional media definitely having its place and its educational role, and that's very good to hear. But the streamers have really, really done something towards giving diversity a boost. And, and would you say there are, are other benefits for you as filmmakers beyond sort of the technical connections? I think what uh, uh, the streaming did is to connect us and get us closer. I mean, Nigeria and Germany is now much closer than it used to be before. Uh, and I think this is so fantastic about it, also to work against prejudices uh, and to 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 support diversity. Uh, and for example, I mean, like uh, uh, um, uh, people of color in Germany, they uh, used to play roles like for the for the ladies, it was always the maid or like very limited job profiles. And nowadays they have leading roles. Uh, I mean, it's the same with like gay. Uh, um, uh, couples or so now you can just tell it in a natural way before it would have always been like oh there's someone gay uh, and I think this is uh, what uh, streaming helped a lot and especially with Africa and uh, Europe or the Western or, or, or the US to, to make it really more uh, diverse definitely it hasn't yeah. had an effect I mean, on diversity go ahead Kenneth yeah, I was trying to say, I really agree because um, because um, there's, there's always this, like Chimamanda said, there's always this um, danger of a single story. And that is like, I mean, you know, like Western media trying to Africa in a certain way and the news about Africa. But now with like the streamers, what people um, can see about Africa, they can actually see the the good parts of Africa. They could actually see the bad parts of Africa. But there's just like, uh, there's, there's just like, uh, the, the, a whole lot of uh, liberation for, 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 for even the audience out there so they can actually see themselves. 
And I think like that was like the thing that made Nollywood to be really huge back in the day because um, uh, it was the first time that black people were really seeing themselves in some of these films. And that is why even though the films were like really badly produced in terms of like sound and pictures, but they were still really traveling. And I think that right now on a much bigger scale, uh, we, we're almost going back to that sort of distribution and people kind of be able to see Africa um, the way we actually want to, to, to portray Africa. Um, Kenneth, you're currently working on another Netflix production, if I'm not mistaken. What's what's in the works for your next project? So right now I have two projects, right? Um, of course, the, the first one is about uh, uh, companionship and, and it's, it's a thriller that is actually set, yeah, I mean, here in the city of Lagos. And right now I'm just working on one that is set around um, um, it, a high school in Nigeria, but but um, on a very personal level, um, there's, there's, there's a film I'm developing um, uh, called Treasure and Mysterious Highlands. It's, it's set in, in 1930s, around the time of British um, mining in Nigeria. And I really want to explore culture from that other aspect. And it's something that I've been developing for almost like five years. And right now with um, streamers like Netflix and Amazon, I'm not really um, scared about taking, I mean, investors money and making films like that. So that for me on a personal level is actually what I'm working on at the moment. And it's, it's taken a, a fair level of the risk away. And Sabina, Sab season two of Barbarians is on the way. I think you've just, just wrapped up filming. Yes, we just wrapped uh, the filming and um, yeah, fantastic experience. We shot in Poland before the first season we shot in, in Hungary. Uh, so we changed the location. And of course, there, there are other um, series in the making. Also, also for, uh, for Netflix? So we are not only working for Netflix, uh, we love to work for Netflix, but uh, we also work for the other streamers. For example, one of the next, for me, very important projects is um, with one of the most uh, pro prolific writers, showrunners in Germany, Annette Hess, who has written a book about the Auschwitz trials, the German house, um, uh, translated and published in 30 countries internationally. And um, it takes place in the 60s where the Auschwitz trials happened in Germany. And it has a lot to do with um, the uh, not wanting to look at the past, not wanting to confront the dark sides and pushing away things uh, because it was in the 60s, new start of society and everybody wanted to look forward and not backwards. And what, uh, uh, how do you deal with the past? and terrible past and you you tell the story on two levels on the one hand through a young woman starting her life her love life and uh, with her family and then working at the Auschwitz trials being confronted with a dark past and um, yeah it's a very touching and uh, fantastic story historically incredibly compelling obviously for Germany and and it sounds like a, an area of that history that we haven't heard so much about so uh, we will definitely look forward to that as well I'd like to thank both of you so much for speaking with me um, about uh, this incredible revolution that streaming has has meant uh, good to hear that there's a lot of uh, a lot of variety coming up in into in all of your projects keep up the great work and all the best to both of you with all of your future projects from us here in Berlin Sabine Demont and Kenneth Yang. Thanks for joining me.